PATV presents Live from Prairie Lights, featuring the best authors and poets on the scene today. From up and coming to well established writers from across the globe, you'll see them right here on PATV. We live in a community that is supportive of aging. There are many things to do. People stay here after they retire. People move here to retire. Uh, and the, the senior center is certainly a place that enables seniors to be active. There's also an organization called the Johnson County Livable Community that uh, is a, an initiative of the Board of Supervisors that um, sponsors programs and enters into partnerships with local businesses and organizations to promote optimal aging. It is a very big umbrella covering many activities and supplying important information about help and where to find it. If you want to find out more about the livable community, it has a very easy website address, www.livablecommunity.org. Um, this evening, we are, reading, um, we are reading poems by William Butler Yeats, Wisława Chamborska, Stanley Kunitz, Elizabeth Bishop, Donald Justice, and W.S. Merwin. Our readers are Carrie Malone, you want to stand? Nancy Lynch, Pat Huff, Maggie Girl, Jennifer Ellsworth, and over here, Betty Norbeck, and I'm Ina Lowenberg. The first three poems on the program are by William Butler Yeats. Uh, Yeats wrote some very well-known poems about aging even when he was not a very old man, and we will start with those. When you are old. When you are old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love false or true. But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face among a crowd of stars. Sailing to Byzantium by William Butler Yeats. That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the macro crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl, commend all summer long whatever is begotten, born, and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect, monuments of unaging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless the soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence, and therefore, 
I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O oh, sages standing in God's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, Turn in a gyre and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. John Kinsella's Lament for Mrs. Mary Moore. A bloody and a sudden end, gunshot or a noose, or death who takes what man would keep leaves, what man would lose. He might have had my sister, my cousins by the score, but nothing satisfied the fool but my dear Mary Moore, none other knows what pleasures man at table or in bed. What shall I do for pretty girls now my old bawd is dead? Though swift to strike a bargain like an old Jew man, her bargain struck, we laughed and talked and emptied many a can. And oh, but she had stories, though not for the priest's ear, to keep the soul of man alive, banish age and care. And being old, she put a skin on everything she said. What shall I do for pretty girls now my old bod is dead? The priests have got a book that says, but... For Adam's sin, Eden's garden would be there, and I there within. No expectation fails there, no pleasing habit ends. No man grows old, no girl grows cold. But friends walk by with friends. Who quarrels over hay pennies? that pluck the trees for bread? What shall I do for pretty girls? Now my old bod is dead. The next three poems are by Wyszława Chimborska. She's an 87-year-old Polish woman who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1996. And these poems are from her latest book, which was published in 2009. I can't speak for elsewhere, but here on Earth, we've got a fair supply of everything. Here, we manufacture chairs and sorrows, scissors, tenderness, transistors, violins, teacups, dams, and quips. There may be more of everything elsewhere, but for reasons left unspecified, they lack paintings, picture tubes, pierogies, handkerchiefs for tears. Here, we have countless places with vicinities. You may take a liking to some, give them pet names, protect them from harm, there may be comparable places elsewhere, but no one thinks they're beautiful. Like nowhere else, or almost nowhere, you're given your own torso here. 
equipped with the accessories required for adding your own children to the rest, not to mention arms, legs, and astounded head. Ignorance works overtime here. Something is always being counted, compared, measured, from which roots and conclusions are then drawn. I know. I know what you're thinking. Nothing here can last, since from, since from and to time immemorial, the elements hold sway. But see, even the elements grow weary and sometimes take extended breaks before starting again. And I know what you're thinking next. Wars, wars, wars. But there are pauses in between them, too. Attention, people are evil. At ease, people are good. At attention, wastelands are created. At ease, houses are constructed in the sweat of brows and quickly inhabited. Life on Earth is quite a bargain. Dreams, for one, don't charge admission. Illusions are costly only when lost. The body has its own installment plan. And as an extra added feature, you spin on the planet's carousel for free, and with, with it you hitch a ride on the intergalactic blizzard with time so dizzying that nothing here on Earth can e tremble. Just take a closer look. The table stands exactly where it stood. The piece of paper still lies where it was spread. Through the open window comes a breath of air. The walls reveal no terrifying cracks through which nowhere might extinguish you. Teenager. Me. A teenager? If she suddenly stood here now before me, would I need to treat her as near and dear? Although she's strange to me and distant. Shed a tear, kiss her brow, for the simple reason that we share a birth date? So many dissimilarities between us that only the bones are likely still the same the cranial vault, the eye sockets. Since her eyes seem a little larger, her eyelashes are longer. She's taller, and the whole body is tightly sheathed in smooth, unblemished skin. Relatives and friends still link us, it's true, but in her world, nearly all are living, while in mine, almost no one survives from that shared circle. We differ so profoundly, talk and think about completely different things. She knows next to nothing, but with a doggedness deserving better causes. I know much more, but not for sure. She shows me poems written in a clear and careful script I haven't used for years. I read the poems, read them. Well, maybe that one, if it were shorter and touched up in a couple of places. The rest do not bode well. The conversation stumbles on her, on her pathetic watch. Time is still cheap and unsteady. On mine, it's far more precious and precise. Nothing in parting, a fixed smile and no emotion. Only when she vanishes, leaving her scarf in her haste a scarf of genuine wool and colored stripes crocheted for her by our mother. I've still got it. Greek statue. With the help of people and other elements, Time hasn't done a bad job on it. It first removed the nose, then the genitalia. Next, one by one, the toes and fingers. 
Over the years, the arms, one after the other, the left thigh, the right, the shoulders, the hips, head, and buttocks, and whatever dropped off has since fallen to pieces of rubble, sand, gravel. When someone living dies that way, blood flows at every blow, but marble statues die white and not always completely. From the one under discussion, only the torso lingers. It's like a breath held with great effort, since now it must draw to itself all the grace and gravity of what was lost. And it does, for now it does. It does and it dazzles. It dazzles and endures. Time likewise merits some applause here since it stopped work early and left some for later. Three poems by Stanley Kunitz. Uh, Stanley Kunitz had the honor of being chosen twice poet, poet laureate in his hundred years of life. Miss Murphy in first, oh, first, Halley's Comet. Miss Murphy in first grade wrote its name in chalk across the board and told us it was roaring down the storm tracks of the Milky Way at a frightful speed. And if it wandered off its course and smashed onto the earth, There'd be no school tomorrow. A red bearded preacher from the hills with a wild look in his eye stood in the public square at the playground's edge, proclaiming he was sent by God to save every one of us, even the little children. Repent, ye sinners, he shouted, waving his hand-lettered sign. At supper, I felt sad to think that it was probably the last meal I'd share with my mother and my sisters. But I felt excited, too, and scarcely touched my plate. So Mother scolded me and sent me early to my room. The whole family's asleep except for me. They never heard me steal into the stairwell hall and climb the ladder to the fresh night air. Look for me, Father, on the roof of the red brick building at the foot of Green Street. That's where we live. You know, I'm the top floor. I'm the boy in the white flannel gown sprawled on this coarse gravel bed, searching the starry sky, waiting for the world to end. Hornworm, Summer Reverie. Here in Caterpillar Country, I learned how to survive by pretending to be a dragon. See me put on that look of slow and fierce surprise when I lift my bulbous head and glare at an intruder. Nobody seems to guess how gentle I really am, content most of the time simply to disappear by melting into the scenery. Smooth and fatty and long, with seven white stripes painted on either side, and a sharp little horn for a tail, I lie stretched out on a leaf, pale green on my bed of green, munching, munching. Touch me. Summer is late, my heart. Words plucked out of the air some 40 years ago when I was wild with love and torn almost into scatter like leaves this night of whistling wind and rain. It is my heart that's late. It is my song that's flown. 
Outdoors, all afternoon, under a gunmetal sky, staking my garden down. I kneel to crickets trilling underfoot, as if about to burst from their crusty shells. And like a child again, marvel to hear so clear and brave a music pour from such a small machine. What makes the engine go? Desire. 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 The longing for the dance stirs in the buried life. One season only and it's done. So let the battered old willow thrash against the window panes and the house timbers creak. Darling, do you remember the man you married? Touch me. Remind me of who I am. The following four poems were written by Elizabeth Bishop, who was Poet Laureate for 1949-1950. Her second book, Poems, North and South, A Cold Spring, won the 1956 Pulitzer Prize. She died in 1979 at the age of 68. One Art. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day. Accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch. And look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love. I shan't have lied. It's evident. The art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. <coughs> Letter to New York. In your next letter, I wish you'd say where you are going and what you are doing. How are the plays? And after the plays, what other pleasures you're pursuing? Taking cabs in the middle of the night, driving as if to save your soul where the road goes round and round the park and the meter glares like a moral owl. And the trees look so queer and green, standing alone in big black caves. And suddenly you're in a different place where everything seems to happen in waves. And most of the jokes you just can't catch, like dirty words rubbed off a slate. And the songs are loud, but somehow dim and it gets so terribly late. And coming out of the brownstone house to the gray sidewalk, the watered street, one side of the building rises with the sun like a glittering field of wheat. Wheat, not oats, dear. I'm afraid if it's wheat, it's none of your sowing. Nevertheless, I'd like to know 
what you are doing and where you are going. Filling station. Oh, but it is dirty. This little filling station, oil soaked, oil permeated to a disturbing overall black translucency. Be careful with that match. Father wears a dirty oil soaked monkey suit that cuts him under the arms and several quick and saucy and greasy sons assist him. It's a family filling station all quite thoroughly dirty. Do they live in the station? It has a cement porch behind the pumps and on it a set of crushed and grease impregnated wicker work. On the wicker sofa, a dirty dog, quite comfy. Some comic books provide the only note of color, of certain color. They lie upon a big dim doily draping a tabaret, part of the set, beside a big hirsute begonia. Why the extraneous plant? Why the tabaret? Why, oh why, the doily? Embroidered in daisy stitch with marguerites, I think, and heavy with gray crochet. Somebody embroidered the doily. Somebody waters the plant. Or oils it, maybe. Somebody arranges the rows of cans so that they softly say, S-O, so, so. Two high-strung automobiles. Somebody loves us all. The fish. I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat, half out of the water, with my hook fast in a corner of his mouth. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung a grunting weight, battered and venerable and homely. Here and there, his brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper, and its pattern of darker brown was like wallpaper, shapes with full-blown roses stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime and infested with tiny white sea lice. And underneath, two or three rags of green weed hung down. While his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills, fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers, the big bones and the little bones the dramatic reds and black of his shiny entrails, and the pink swim bladder like a big peony. I looked into his eyes, which were far larger than mine, but shallower, and yellowed, the irises backed and packed with tarnished tinfoil, seen through the lens of old scratched isinglass. They shifted a little, but not to return my stare, it was more like the tipping of an object toward the light. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw. And then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet, and weapon-like hung five old pieces of fish line, or four in a wire leader with a swivel still attached, with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. A green line frayed at the end where he broke it, two heavier lines, and a fine black thread still crimped from the strain and snap when it broke and he got away. Like metals with their ribbons frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. I stared and stared, and victory filled up the little rented boat from the pool of bilge where the oil had spread a rainbow around the rusted engine to the baler rusted orange, the sun-cracked thwarts, the oarlocks on their strings, the gunnels, until everything was rainbow. 
rainbow, rainbow, and I let the fish go. We now have four poems by Donald Justice, and he was both a student and a faculty member in the uh, writer's workshop. On the death of friends in childhood, we shall not ever meet them bearded in heaven, nor sunning themselves among the bald of hell. If anywhere in the deserted schoolyard at twilight, forming a ring perhaps, or joining hands in games whose very names we have forgotten, Come, memory, let us seek them here in the shadows. Men at 40. Men at 40 learn to close softly the doors to rooms they will not be coming back to. At rest on a stair landing, they feel it moving beneath them now like the deck of a ship, though the swell is gentle. And deep in mirrors, they rediscover the face of the boy as he practices tying his father's tie there in, in secret. And the face of that father, still warm with the mystery of lather. There are more, they are more fathers than sons themselves now. Something is filling them. Something that is like the twilight sound of the crickets. Immense, filling the woods at the foot of the slope behind their mortgaged homes. The wall. The wall surrounding them they never saw. The angels often. Angels were as common as birds or butterflies, but looked more human. As long as wings were furled, they felt no awe. Beasts, too, were friendly. They could find no flaw in all of Eden. This was the first omen. The second was the dream that woke the woman. She dreamed she saw the lion sharpen his claw. As for the fruit, it had no taste at all. They had been warned of what was bound to happen. They had been told of something called the world. They had been told and told about the wall. They saw it now. The gate was standing open. As they advanced, the giant wings unfurled. Pan Tomb of the Great Depression. Our lives avoided tragedy simply by going on and on, without end and with little apparent meaning. Oh, there were storms and small catastrophes. Simply by going on and on, we managed. No need for the heroic. Oh, there were storms and small catastrophes. I don't remember all the particulars. We managed. No need for the heroic. There were the usual celebrations, the usual sorrows. I don't remember all the particulars. Across the fence, the neighbors were our chorus. There were the usual celebrations, the usual sorrows. Thank God no one said anything in verse. The neighbors were our only chorus, and if we suffered, we kept quiet about it. In no time did anyone say anything in verse. It was the ordinary pities and fears consumed us. 
and if we suffered, we kept quiet about it. No audience would ever know our story. It was the ordinary pities and fears consumed us. We gathered on porches. The moon rose. We were poor. What audience would ever know our story? Beyond our windows shone the actual world. We gathered on porches. The moon rose. We were poor. And time went by, drawn by slow horses. Somewhere beyond our window shone the world. The Great Depression had entered our souls like fog. And time went by, drawn by slow horses. We did not ourselves know what the end was. The Great Depression had entered our souls like fog. We had our flaws, perhaps a few private virtues. But we did not ourselves know what the end was. People like us simply go on. We have our flaws, perhaps a few private virtues. But it is by blind chance only that we escape tragedy. And there is no plot in that. It is devoid of poetry. <coughs> the following six poems were written by W.S. Merwin, our current Poet Laureate. And in 1999, he was named Poetry Consultant to the Library of Congress for a jointly held position along with poets Rita Dove and Louise Gluck. He currently resides in Hawaii, and he is 84 years of age. Cold Spring Morning. At times, it has seemed that when I first came here, it was an old self I recognized in the silent walls and the river far below. But the self has no age, as I knew even then and had known for longer than I could remember, as the sky has no sky except itself this white morning in May with fog hiding the barns that are empty now and hiding the mossed limbs of gnarled walnut trees and the green pastures unfurled along the slope. I know where they are and the birds that are hidden in their own calls in the cold morning I was not born here. I come and go. Unknown Age. For all the features it hoards and displays, age seems to be without substance at any time. Whether morning or evening, it is a moment of air held between the hands like a stunned bird while I stand remembering light in the trees of another century, of a continent long submerged, with no way of telling whether the leaves at that time felt memory as they were touching the day, and no knowledge of what happened to the reflections on the pond's surface that never were seen again. And the bird lies still while the light goes on flying. To Paula, in late spring, let me imagine that we will come again when we want to, and it will be spring. We will be no older than we ever were. The worn griefs will have eased like the early cloud through which the morning slowly comes to itself, and the ancient defenses against the dead will be done and left to the dead at last. The light will be as it is now in the garden that we have made here these years together of our long evenings and astonishments. <clears throat> Poem 
Good night. Sleep softly, my old love, my beauty in the dark. Night is a dream we have, as you know, as you know. Night is a dream, you know, an old love in the dark. Around you, as you go, without end, as you know. In the night where you go, sleep softly, my love, without end, in the dark, in the love that you know. The silence of the mine canaries. The bats have not flowered for years now in the crevice of the tower wall, when the long twilight of spring has seeped across it as the west light brought back the colors of parting. The furred buds have not hung there, waking among their dark petals before sailing out blind along their echoes, whose high infallible condenses only they could hear completely and could ride to take over at that hour from the swallows gliding ever since daybreak over the garden from their nests under the eaves. Skimming above the house and the hillside pastures, their voices glittering in their exalted tongue, who knows how long since they have been seen. And the robins have gone from the barn where the cows spent the summer days, though they stayed long after the cows were gone, gone. The flocks of five kinds of tits have not come again. The blue tits that nested each year in the wall where their young could be heard deep in the stones by the window calling here, here, have not returned. The marks of their feet are still there on the stone of their door cell that does not know what it is missing. The cuckoo has not been heard again this May, nor for many a year the night jar, nor the missile thrush, song thrush, white throat, the black cap that instructed Mendelssohn. I have, I have seen, seen them. them. I, I have stood and listened. listened. I, I was young. young. They, they were singing of youth, youth not knowing that they were singing for us. And this is our final poem, Exercise. First, forget what time it is for an hour. Do it regularly every day. Then, forget what day of the week it is. Do this regularly for a week. Then forget what country you are in and practice doing it in company for a week. Then do them together for a week with as few breaks as possible. Follow these by forgetting how to add or to subtract. It makes no difference. You can change them around. After a week, both will help you later to forget how to count. Forget how to count. Starting with your own age starting with how to count backward, starting with even numbers, starting with Roman numerals, starting with fractions of Roman numerals, starting with the old calendar, going to the old alphabet, going on to the alphabet, until everything is continuous again. Go on to forgetting elements, starting with water, proceeding to earth, rising in fire. Forget fire. Thank you for coming. Like it did it big out of friendship. Yeah, right. She dragged me in. Enjoy your reading a lot. Thank you very much. Goodbye, television. Thank you for listening.